Perhaps the most daunting and frustrating aspect of the universe is that it's truly enormous. Even in our own galaxy, the distances to the nearest stars seems quite frankly insane. If you were to head out at speeds we can manage with our technology now, even with tiny microprobes fitted with laser-driven light sails, it's going to be decades before you can get to Alpha Centauri. And if we were able to send humans on that journey with all of our supplies, equipment, and human accoutrements, it could take centuries and require a generational ship where several successive generations are born, live, and die on that ship. This might require nothing less than a hollowed out asteroid city to realistically do it. This might not be such a problem for some humans. Before the modern age, it was possible to be born, live, and die in a single village without ever leaving its immediate environs. An asteroid is not so different, as long as it has enough to keep a suitable human occupied and happy. But if you get someone born on such a ship, stuck there, that wants more, such as seeing Earth, then you end up with ethical and practical problems. Generational ships in this way could become nightmare societies that must restrict information very carefully to prevent wanderlust and pining for Earth. Indeed, most of the inhabitants might not even know of Earth on purpose, once the generation that truly knew of it died off. This is not ideal, and indeed humans often infer or hear of things that are not intended by the powers that be opening the way for civil strife and disobedience and unpleasantness in the sealed environment of a hollowed out asteroid. Not good. Better not let Chuck with his crazy ideas about the utopian world outside the asteroid get a hold of the airlock controls. But think for a moment on future technology and how this projection could dramatically change. One game changer here would be life extension. We see our existence through the lens of our lifespan, the average still being below a century. But we're also making inroads in understanding the aging process, and it's within the realm of possibility that future humans might live significantly longer than we do now. Indeed, if Aubrey de Grey is right, there are people walking around right now that may catch a wave of anti-aging technology, and then end up living for centuries in the sense that if you catch a development that takes you to 150 years, then that buys time for more discoveries that may take you to 500 years, and so on. But there are limits. No matter what you do, you can't extend biological life as we know it indefinitely. You will always lose the odds at some point and get vaporized while trying to fix the oven on the generational asteroid ship. Even as protected as you might be, as opposed to the risk-laden existence here on Earth. But the point here is that if you live for 5,000 years, a few centuries spent on a non-generational ship might just be something that some are willing to do. We live on a planet where most people don't climb Mount Everest, but a certain type of personality does. Space is a little different from that in the adventurer's eye. The I am going to do it first spirit, or conquer it because it's there. Indeed, Mars colonization will depend on this, should the plan of SpaceX see fruition. There will be takers, no matter how harsh the living conditions of a fledgling Mars colony is guaranteed to be. So if you change the time equation and ignore our current human concerns of our lifespan, the game changes. Especially if you can determine that there's somewhere to actually go. Which we already know that there might be at Proxima Centauri. It may be a world worse than Mars, and probably is, but at least we know that there are planets there. The first seeds of something that we may someday set foot on, done by a 5,000 year old human that's seen it all, who sees it as might as well be the first person to truly see an alien world. In this scenario, Chuck's got nothing to lose. He'll step off the asteroid one way or another. But this is merely the nearest star system. For humans to spread beyond that, we have three choices. Number one, do it biologically as we are, albeit with much longer lifespans. Number two, do it semi-biologically with a more intense fusion of our biology and technology and three, do it robotically with an AI. Interestingly, with the latter comes an odd possibility of not faster than light travel, but easy speed of light travel. More on that in a bit. Before we proceed here, it must be noted that any of these factors are very likely to also affect alien civilizations. They are going to be beholden to the same rules, the laws of physics that we are. So at some stage in their development, they are going to go through this, should they wish to truly explore space beyond their star system. 
It's possible that no one deems this worth it, and never does, a solution to the Fermi paradox in its own right. But let's say they do, and we will as well someday. So number one, do it biologically. This is a situation where we've spread to Alpha Centauri and set up a colony there equal to Earth. This provides two chances for humans to press further, because the closest stars to Alpha Centauri are going to be somewhat different choices than that of the Sun. But there's also the possibility that Earth might start colonizing other nearby stars. So this starts a potentially exponential spread of humans into the galaxies as other ships are sent out to colonize other stars. This snowballs the more star systems you colonize. In a few million years, you may have a presence, at fully non-relativistic speeds, in every suitable star system in the galaxy, so long as you don't run into anyone else that's already there. It would be very sad indeed if Chuck, after all his interstellar troubles, finds that his dream planet is already inhabited, and he's denied entry by the aliens for similar reasons to why cruise ships, upon disembarkation, make you discard any potentially disease-ridden produce you may have come into possession of. No Chuck, but the ship's AI computer may visit the surface. Number two is the merging of biology with technology. Here we leave poor Chuck spending his remaining days in orbit of a planet he's not allowed to visit, missing the AI he needs to get back to Earth because it's run off and began a new life on the surface. Introduce our second space traveler, Gwen, who has decided that the most viable solution to all human existential crises and questions is to become a cyborg. The problem with longevity in biology is that we're confined to our brains. Here, merely making a copy of yourself on a computer doesn't quite cut it. You aren't that emulation. You don't translate your actual conscious being into that computer. But with a cyborg, that might be possible. Translation, of course, is the key question here. But there may be a way. If you start out biological and then you start getting cyborg augmentation, such as hip replacement surgery, and then it goes further until you're replacing every neuron of the brain very gradually with technology, that can assume the functions of the former neuron. You may even be able to do it so gradually that you don't even notice a difference. Eventually, you're still you, or as close to that as you can get, but partly or eventually entirely cybernetic. If that's the case, you might be able to translate yourself to a computer and make a backup. Though it's still unclear, even then, that you'd just be making a copy, instead of actually downloading you into a new body. But there may be ways to do that, in such a changed paradigm, such as incorporating yourself into an ever-augmenting and growing main brain where you are the source, but capable of disseminating yourself with copies you receive data from. You become we in this case instead of individuals, you are the Borg. That aside, at least here you may have a shot at far greater longevity than biology can provide. Here Gwen becomes greater than the original Gwen, even though it's still just Gwen when you get right down to it. Here intergalactic travel and colonization by Gwen comes onto the table. If she lives indefinitely, say a hundred million years, then comfortable sublight speed to other nearby galaxy isn't as big of a deal as it would be for someone that lives less than a hundred years. But here the lines get blurred. What was once biological that is converted into being a machine is a bit different than a machine that's always been one. This is where AI comes onto the table, and it has one advantage over the biological, or formerly biological, so long as it can maintain its existence. It doesn't care about the passage of time. And this is where everything gets interesting, because most of the observable universe comes onto the table as explorable. At slow speeds, this is limited partly by the expansion of the universe. A machine going very long distances will have to deal with that. But there's a wild card, which is time dilation. All three options are subject to this, but it requires that you do not care about remaining in the time that you started, because no matter what you do, traveling at high relativistic speeds will deposit you into the far future, from where you started in time. But if you don't care about that, then game on for exploring a large portion of the universe. Here you go at high relativistic speeds, so long as you can develop the technology to do so and figure out some way of mitigating matter hitting your ship at relativistic speeds. If you can achieve this, enormous swaths of the observable universe come into play. Millions of galaxies are now within your reach, again so long as you don't care about time. 
Gwen or an intelligent machine may not. Even aliens may not. Only humans might have some connection to their own time. But even then, not all. There will be those willing to travel to the far future if given the chance, even if they can't return to their own time. But that's not the only way. There are ways consistent with relativity to travel at faster than light speeds. This is the famous Alcubierre warp drive concept, as advanced by Miguel Alcubierre. You can see an interview I did with Dr. Alcubierre on Event Horizon, link in the description below. The idea here is to isolate a piece of space-time and get it to move faster than light, carrying your ship along like riding in a car. It's the car that's doing high speed on the highway, not you directly. You're just along for the ride. This idea is consistent with relativity but fraught with all sorts of issues that may or may not be surmountable, including whenever you go FTL, you have also built a time machine that could come with paradoxes. The fact that the drive still requires enormous amount of energy to create, and there's also being no clear way on how to slow it down and bring it out of warp, and also the radiation environment within the warp bubble and so on. And most tellingly perhaps, we do not see alien starships coming out of warp in an Alcubierre style warp drive, since the radiation coming off such a thing, if directed at your planet, would cause a mass extinction. On the other hand, for a Type 3 galaxy spanning machine civilization, they might be able to solve those problems. Perhaps there simply aren't any yet, and the future will be full of warping machines. But there are other ways to envision travel. If you're dealing with the copy scenario where you send out copies of yourself that become you once again once you receive their data set, then the idea of speed of light beaming comes into play. But not quite in the sense of Star Trek. Here you set up a network of 3D printer probes over the course of millions of years at sublight speeds. Designed specifically to send data of creating you at the speed of light through electromagnetic radiation to reconstruct a copy of you on site. As data is collected by this digital clone, it's sent back at the speed of light. It may take a very long time to receive and integrate that information, but in this universe, time is the one thing we have in abundance. Maybe the future means working on very long timescales, and if you're willing to do that, then most of the problems of interstellar and even intergalactic travel are solved, simply with enough time and patience, and above all, persistence. But I leave you with one last thought. If it proves impractical to ever explore intergalactic space, even though the laws of physics don't prohibit it, then there is one other possibility. We don't understand the creation of universes. We don't know how it happens. But if it proves possible to figure that out and understand all of the rules, it may be in principle possible to create universes artificially. This is very far future stuff, usually envisioned as something civilizations at the end of time would only try to do. But say they did. In their time, the universe would be so expanded that intergalactic travel would very likely be truly impossible, if you even know other galaxies exist. So creating and escaping to a new universe entirely changes everything. There you don't need other galaxies, you just need other universes. A strange proposition indeed, functionally trapped in your galaxy, but not in your universe. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently uncertain about creating new universes when this one is cached. To make a new one, we'd finally know what its geometry is, and maybe it turns out that it's turtle-shaped. So you ask the scientist at the end of the universe if all universes are like that, and then he says, it's turtles all the way down, and that's the last statement ever said in the universe while we escape to a new one. Huh. Anyway, be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.